doing good, Mike. You want to kick us oh. off? We just started right now. You're good. <laughs> All right. Great, great. Uh, is there any camera for the room or am I uh, just transmitting to the blind here? You are a disembodied voice. Oh, all right. So, okay, so you can't even see my camera. No, nope, we minimized you first because it was covering the screen. Sorry. You can't minimize me? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, great. Yeah, if, um, if you're ready, I assume we are on slide number two with the research computing and data capabilities model? We are on the first slide. Oh, the first slide? Okay, well then, yeah, I'll start by introducing myself. <laughs> um, well, hey, um, thanks for letting me dial in virtually today. Uh, I would much rather be there in person, uh, both for the conference and obviously for the networking events at night uh, are very fun in DC. Uh, my name is Mike Nowicki. I currently serve as Director for High Performance Computing at Mississippi State uh, University. Um, we have a pretty robust supercomputing capability here at Mississippi State University. I think people don't expect to find that uh, here in the, the, the South. Um, we have two top 500 systems. Uh, we got 45 petabytes of storage. Um, so I wouldn't say we're the biggest, but we're definitely not the smallest, um, which I think kind of lends us to um, really kind of talk about how we can coordinate and make research computing and data um, more accessible and, and more available to uh, our researchers. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll talk about the RCD model. We're there. Cool. All right, so if you haven't heard of the research, computing, and data capabilities model, uh, I would highly recommend that your organization take a look at it. Um, it's produced by CARC, which is the Campus Research Computing Consortium. Um, what they've done is they've developed about 190-ish questions that assesses your ability to do research, computing, and data. Um, and when you think about research computing, a lot of people think about high performance computing. Um, they think about the system, but the reality is that there's several other aspects, you know, and this conference is probably primarily concerned about data, uh, which is very, very important when you're trying to do computer and analytics. Um, so what this model can do is, you know, just looking at the bullets there, um, various approaches and factors for creating and maintaining an RCD program. So supercomputing is not just about a computer, it's really an ecosystem. Um, so it can kind of look at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Um, it's great to obviously compare to your peer institutions. It helps your VPR feel comfortable about maybe where you're at. Um, and then it also identifies collaboration opportunities with other institutions. But I would say today's presentation, the actual more important thing is was collaborations within our own institution uh, and how we were able to be more successful there. So if we can go to the next slide. We're right there. So a little bit about the journey of Mississippi State University. Um, we're really not talking so much about a new process or a new technology, but we're really talking about using existing models and frameworks to build a team of people. Um, if you're an attendee of PERC, this year's theme will be human-powered computing uh, because it takes a lot of people to run computers. Um, so previously I mentioned, hey, you know, we've got this system, but there's other components to running a successful high performance computing. Um, and this is the actual RCD or research computing data capabilities model that we performed at Mississippi State University. And you can see that we actually look pretty good in our system capable system facing capabilities. But then when you look at things like research facing capabilities, the ability to engage with researchers and help to connect them with the right uh, analytic and data resources, that's a little bit weak. Our data facing capabilities, our software facing capabilities, and then even a strategy, um, those are a little bit weak. Um, so we can now go to our VPR, and I found this to be a very, very powerful tool to communicate with her on where we should do investment in research computing uh, and data. So just kind of going a little bit more in depth here, if we can go to the next slide. There. You're good, Mike. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, sorry, I didn't change my own slide yet. <laughs> no. So, um, so kind of, you know, before we kind of talked about the system facing capabilities, the data, the software, um, and the uh, research or facilitation, these categories further break out to help you better understand where you are more capable and where maybe you need more investment. Uh, and you can kind of see here is that when you look at Mississippi State infrastructure systems, 
we're actually pretty pretty strong in those areas. And when you look at our system operations, we, we need some help in documentation, and I can validate that's true. Uh, the other thing is we need help in uh, change management and version control. I can also validate that that is indeed true. And some of these things, right, when we evaluate our organizations, we already kind of have an idea of that these things will exist. Uh, but this just kind of adds some, uh, you know, some finite data uh, to it, and it helps you communicate around your organization why you're asking for resources. And then it also kind of helps you communicate to those researchers what maybe you can do uh, for them in a more robust way. So that was of the five system face of the five uh, facings. System is one that I wanted to talk about, and then I wanted to expand on the next slide, which is our data facing capabilities. So as we, a university, as the HPC director, um, we started conducting this uh, evaluation. And what we found is we got to the data facing capabilities and it wasn't that we can't do it, it was that we just don't know. Um, so I had been attending some conferences over the last couple of years and they said, hey, if you're not working with your library, you're probably not doing it right. Um, so I reached out to Dr. Pankel, who I'm not sure if she's in the room there, but she's definitely at the conference with us today. Um, and I said, hey, have you guys been thinking about research computing and data? And they had, um, which was a really great thing to hear is that they were already moving forward in that direction as well. And you'll find out later that they have a lot of strengths that we don't have and we have a lot of strengths they don't have. And by partnering and you know collaborating, that was really strong. So you can kind of see here is that we provide maybe broader coverage. That 70% number is that the available coverage to the university. Um, but when you look at our data analytics, our data analysis, data visualization, um, data discovery and collection, we're not as strong uh, in those areas. So the great thing about this was it really identified an opportunity for Mississippi State to collaborate within itself um, to create more research computing and data uh, capabilities. So that's kind of what's, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we're really focusing on building a team, not necessarily a, cap uh, a, a technology or even a new process. And that's where you kind of come to our research team slide up here next. You're good. So you're looking at that research team is, you know, high performance computing is where I lived in my own little silo. And then, you know, through this analysis, we found out about the libraries um, and really opened up IT services. And that's where I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Lauren, to uh, go with uh, the next few slides. Thanks, Mike. Everyone, I'm Lauren Geiger. I am the digital archivist at Mississippi State University Libraries. And so, like Mike said, um, HPC and MSU Libraries are kind of the core of this team, but we could not do any, we couldn't even begin to do this collaboration without the services of everyone here. Um, ITS is crucial for understanding the cyber infrastructure of campus, ORSC is up to date on the latest mandates and standards and absolutely none of these talks would be happening if it weren't for our researchers and making sure that we are looking at what they need and doing what we can to ensure that those needs are met and then being able to work and obtain some of their wants. So as Mike said, there's a lot of strengths and weaknesses when it comes to both the library and HPC, but one of the beautiful things is that they really do balance out. When looking at the library, we are really strong in research data management. Whether you are cataloging a collection or you are processing some archival papers, everything we do sort of involves data management on that front. We do a lot of work where it comes to describing data, making sure that people are able to not only be able to find it, whether it's physical or digital, but being able to actually work with it, being able to use it. Data visual Data visualization is another area we have become very strong in with the accession of our data science librarian, Dr. Carolina Sinescalci. She's another member of this team. And we also do a lot of data, visu data visualization through our library instruction workshops, through our um, research services, which is, that is no longer the word for it, and then um, our digital media center does a lot of technology instructions, sessions that involve this. Second, we are very service-oriented work. Everything we do involves around making sure that our patrons and our users can be able to get what they need and get it in a timely fashion and be able to work with it to the best of their ability. We are really good at making sure that people just are able to get the materials they need and if we can't necessarily find them, then we can know who can get them. 
Third, we're really well connected on campus, from our subject specialist to our embedded librarians to the librarians who really focus on instructions and orientation work. We have connections to several different faculty and staff members throughout the entirety of our campus. We're also located at the center near some of our largest colleges, and that never hurts. The strengths of HPC really focus a lot on where we lack, which is the data storage. And I'm gonna pull up my notes so I can make sure I'm saying everything correct. So when looking at HPC, their greatest strengths really are the data storage and the computational capabilities and knowledge systems. So HPC has a RAID-enabled disk system that provides nearly 12 petabytes of space for their research computers that can be accessed on almost 800 desktops or laptops. When looking at their long-term storage, they have an LTO tape library that holds nine petabytes of near-line storage. They also have two top 500 computers, Orion and Hercules. Orion was benchmarked in 2019 as the fifth fastest, fastest computer in the US higher education. They also have a network system across the entire state of Mississippi that connects them from MSU to facilities like the NASA's Stennis Space Center, and, through, and this is all done through the Mississippi Optical Network. Clearly, they have more storage compute and infrastructure to handle data than any of us would know what to do with. So now that we've gotten some of our strengths out of the way, it comes to our challenges and our approaches. One of the biggest challenges we do have on our campus are our silo departments. There hasn't necessarily been the strongest history of pooling resources or collaborating when it comes to these programs or software, which can lead to some, per some pieces, some resources being purchased twice. One of the things we really wanna focus on is building relationships that are focused on RCD and being able to work with the researchers and the staff and the faculty and be able to collaborate with them when, we are, when looking at their needs. Limited access to software storage and compute is another area that we are slightly, that we are working on. When we're to be able to work on this more, we are looking at trying to figure out um, how can we work with our researchers to discover their needs throughout campus. We are actually hosting an event on Thursday called Data and Donuts, where we are going to bring together researchers to talk in a very informal way about what they want to do. The third want is, um, is that there is limited staff and faculty capabilities to support the researchers. By building systems and support capabilities through workshops, trainings, and incorporating this into their daily workflows, we are hoping to be able to sort of fix this issue and be able to make sure that we have the support system in place to be able to build up the RCD that we want to have. And the final, the final challenge we can see is recognizing the value of an RCD. If you, as someone who, I, I come from a very strong data side. I was the metadata librarian before this. I know all about how to make sure that you can find and make materials accessible and discoverable. I got thrown into the world of high computing um, in July, and so I wasn't quite sure how it could really be that successful or that useful for us, but through my conversations with Mike and being a part of our research team, I can see how our CD can go beyond the typical, like you would think of it being really useful for engineering and for our ag school, but how our humanities departments could also really benefit from all of this. So a way that we can approach this challenge is really communicating with everyone, not just your senior leadership, but your faculty, your staff, your boots on the ground researchers, about how RCD is going to help them in the long term. We want them to be able to take all the data that they've collected and that they've spent so much time working for to be able to use it as many ways as possible, not just to be able to say, okay, one and done project, put the data on a shelf, and probably never touch it again. We want them to see that when they work more on a data management plan and incorporating high compute, we'll be able to extend that data life cycle and be able to make sure that, is, that it is accessible and discoverable for as many people as possible. To this end, we are working on a CC Star Area 7 planning grant. We are looking to throw this grant to establish specific needs and wants for our campus stakeholders. The main goals are to better understand research computing needs so that we can be able to meet them. We are looking at creating a cyber infrastructure plan that will evolve with their needs and be able to accommodate all the growth and change that higher education is naturally known for. And then we are also looking to broaden research computing support to be able to um, create sort of this ecosystem on campus of research and data collaboration. Some of our future objectives here are 
whether or not we get the CC Star grant, we know that this is time sensitive, this is important work, and we're gonna be doing it no matter what. But if we do get a lot of data from the grant, then we wanna be able to use that to better direct our resources and to be able to make sure that we are maximizing our productivity, to use a very business speak in a library language world. We are also hoping to create a storefront at the library to assist faculty and researchers so that they can leverage their research and compute needs. We're, this would be librarians who work at the campus, whether they're on our team or whether we would um, start to incorporate this into their work, being able to say, hey, so a researcher comes in and says, I have XYZ data, how can I work with it? And we may be able to say, well, you need to go talk to High Compute. Or, okay, maybe you need to do some better descriptions. They probably come down and talk to me. And then our last workaround uh, Mike will talk about is how we're gonna democratize the research. Yeah, and I just wanna kind of talk about Lauren saying, hey, I've been learning about high performance computing. Um, I got a tour of the library about six months ago and I'm a lifelong nerd, uh, not an academic, uh, and, and I always love the library, I take the kids there, but um, I found out it was way more than just checking out books. Um, it was really, really amazing. So I do always kind of, uh, I like to throw in there, it's like, man, there's a lot of learning going on here and collaborate in these ways. Uh, is huge, and that kind of goes back to democratize research compute data uh, management, right? Is it if you know, Lauren mentioned earlier, if you're an engineer, 100%, you probably got access to a computer, you know how to use it, you know how to apply it. Um, but if you're in the digital humanities, I think is uh, is what it used to be called, um, you're probably will have less access, and then in some cases maybe have less access to the people that could help you take your data and apply some of these uh, analytic techniques that require high performance computing. Um, and for instance, Mississippi State does have a social science research center, uh, and we're really trying to engage with them to find out what kind of data do they have, um, how could we apply it to further their research and their research goals. Uh, we've met with our anthropology department, we've met with our psychology department, our biologists. So the idea is just to make sure that that, that research compute and the data uh, management can be further and wider available to everyone on campus there. So thanks for uh, listening and I will turn it over to Montana State. Hi, I'm Dora Lynn Rossman. I'm Dean of the Library at Montana State University. Um, and my colleague, Jason Clark, is the head of research optimization, analytics, and data services at the MSU Library. And not to be confused, we've got two MSUs here, so they paired us up and got a lot of MSU today. Um, so some of you may have heard a talk I gave in the Lightning Talks in Denver this last spring about this project. So this is a bit of an update. Um, we're going to give you an assessment of a need, a partnership formation background, and projects and instructional collaborations. And specifically, this is around the formation of what we've called the Research Alliance at Montana State. So um, much like our colleagues at Mississippi State, we had actually conducted the RCDCM work as well. And um, just to reemphasize what Mike was covering, um, this is a self-reporting tool. So this is our own assessment of how we think we're doing. Um, and But it involves expertise from across the institution. So we had librarians, um, data um, specialists, IT people participating in it. And rather than explaining the whole thing again, um, we do have in our presentation slides that will be on the CNI website, a link to our actual report. And Jason's going to go into more detail when he speaks. Um, and then just to make you aware, there are five different areas that you report on in this survey, and these are the five areas, um, researcher facing, data facing, software, system, and strategy. And we specifically, for this conversation, focused on researcher and data facing roles. We also um, took a look at the research cycle. So this is a graphic that we made that was modified slightly from other ones we found out there on the web. But more broadly, you know, if you think about the research life cycle, there are many different stopping points on the way. And frankly, people who need help in this life cycle don't care who you are, who you work for. They just care that you know what you're doing and that you can give them the help. And so that was part of what we were seeing, um, as Lauren mentioned in, in a presentation earlier I heard, is that people don't like to be bounced around. They just want to find that help. And so um, we were realizing that that was what was happening, and so we decided that if we could do some co-location, that that would benefit the users, but it also would benefit us in being able to do our work better. So we can, in the Research Alliance, all see ourselves in some portion 
of this circle here, or oval, I should say. So um, initially, the Research Alliance was actually floated when my predecessor interviewed for his job as to the dean of the library. And 10 years later, I got to help see it come into fruition. Um, and so um, this has been an idea because we saw these tensions around bouncing around and data services were growing. Um, we continue to identify potential partnerships through just conversations across the university. Um, we were participating in a lot of conversations while we were co not co-located, and so that it was hard because it would be once a month, once every two months that we were talking as a larger group. Um, so we were leading to a commonly shared space, which we thought would get us over the hump of having um, some better oriented services. We also identified through our partners, we all pitched in money to build a space together and the space allocation, it's physically housed in the library, which again is in the heart of campus and so that's a really great um, opportunity. We also worked with Rebecca, Rebecca Bryant from the Research Development Partnership at OCLC. Um, she has some really good perspectives on what's happening out in the research landscape and so she provided a bit of a mirror to us um, to see where we were going. Um, so the partners that we ended up with are the Office of Research Development, so that's our pre-grant award office under the Vice President for Research, the Sac Center for Faculty Excellence, which supports teaching and research, um, and they're under the Provost's Office, the Undergraduate Scholars Program, which supports the undergraduate research experience for our undergraduate students, also under the Provost's Office, uh, Research Cyber Infrastructure, which is in the um, University Information Technology Vice President's Office, and then the MSU Library and our Rhodes Division, and Jason's the head of that, and um, as the library, we report to the Provost. So we've got the Provost Office, the Vice President for Research's Office, and the CIO's Office, um, Chief Information Officer's Office, all represented in this alliance. So that's, I think, pretty cool. Um, so we wanted to put together something that was a vision, and our vision for ourselves is that we bring together expertise from across MSU to help researchers achieve their goals. We make your grant proposals more competitive, your research more visible, provide data management and publishing support, and help you translate your research into the classroom. We came up with this description of ourselves before we even moved into our space. We needed to sort of have an identity for ourselves amongst the group. Um, this is our initial floor diagram. This is um, on the third floor of our library, and basically it was a space that we just, it had been study space, and I, if you, during the Q&A, if you wanna ask me what students think of us taking away study space, I'm glad to answer that. Um, but this is a mixture of hoteling spaces, office spaces, teaching spaces, um, conference spaces, and so we actually took this diagram, and this is what we've got printed out when you walk in, because it's a bunch of different people in different offices, and so we've got like Jason's over here, and oops, um, the upper left in the library space, we've got Center for Faculty Excellence across the top. But anyway, the point is, this is a space that we're all together, and it creates all these collisions and, and good kinds of collisions, not vendor benders. <laughs> Uh, we also came up with some taglines as we um, emerged as the Research Alliance, um, uniting research expertise in a single space, simplifying faculty and student access to services that will incre increase their research impact, and then supporting successful research from idea to achievement, and your one-stop shop to increase research impact. So these are different taglines we use depending on the context. Um, and then in my last piece here, um, I wanted to emphasize some of the things we did in sort of going into this. One of the things I kept saying to my predecessor is we need a memorandum of understanding. We don't report through the same people, ultimately to the president, but that's the closest to all of us. And so we wanted to have an MOU because it's like being a roommate, right? You're gonna move into a space together and what are some ground rules that we've decided upon? And that really helped us think through a lot of the logistics of what does this look like in reality from who turns on the lights, to how do people schedule with us, to what do we do if we want, need to buy more copy paper. I mean, a lot of those little nitty gritty de details. Um, it was a little challenging moving from that virtual to the in-person because we'd been meeting virtually for so long that it was suddenly real this summer when we moved in. Um, we needed to define our services and communications. So how do we present ourselves on the web? Do we have an email address? Um, 
how do people make reservations. Uh, we had some challenges with figuring out what the naming looked like because we've got so many partners. Um, Center for Faculty Excellence ends up, ended up having their name sort of pulled out because they support teaching too. And so we've got Center for Faculty Excellence and Research Alliance on the big window and then all the partners listed on the next window over. Um, I mentioned the communication channels. And ultimately, the reason we did this initially was for our users, but as Jason's gonna say to you, there were a lot of benefits that came out for us as partners. And so we've seen a lot of new opportunities come forward. Um, and so I'm gonna invite Jason up here to cover those. And the other thing I'll say while he's coming up here is um, there are tremendous benefits to having a lot more faculty coming in the library as a result of this partnership. So again, during the Q&A, if you wanna ask me about that, I'd be glad to share. Hello, and if you had the opportunity, um, UCSD and University of Göttingen um, did a presentation on an e-research alliance, which is a very similar idea, but they're talking about international collaboration. So if you didn't see that one, um, please check that one out on the video, because these are similar ideas. Scales are a little different. We were thinking locally with a lot of our collaborations, but there's lots of room and opportunity um, for, for this idea. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm gonna talk a bit more about projects and collaborations and the early successes with, with this project. Um, again, a lot of this comes back to infrastructure. You heard Cliff talk in the plenary about what he, what, what he was envisioning as infrastructure in certain ways. But I would uh, po posit to the group that parts of our infrastructure are, yes, computing power, but also expertise, people, and the social rela relationships we can build locally and uh, even beyond internationally. Um, what I'm showing here, again, is the through line with a lot of this is uh, obviously M Mississippi State was thinking um, further down the line towards a, a more front-facing service. We were a little bit ahead of that, and we had started that, co that collaboration, and now we're ready, we're ready to have that, that shop, that stop, stopping service where people can come in. Um, but that doesn't start without assessment which is part of this, another part of this through line. And what you can see here is anything you saw in the yellow is a tier three in the RTDCM tool. Um, so those were opportunities. Anything we were kind of below 40 um, and, and identified or assessed as less than uh, a, a tier two or a tier one service. Um, this is a, the reason we bring this to, to this group is because we found this not only really valuable for ourselves, but I, Michael always also spoke to when you're moving outside your environment and you need to show something to the provost and you do this assessment and you can kind of speak to, you can benchmark against other institutions, this moves people. It moves your organization toward change. So I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. I just wanna show the details of these questions are interesting. Um, you can see we had a goose egg on researcher awareness. Um, so one of the first things uh, Dorlin put forward was that we would bring a, a group of librarian specialists together. Um, so we started with an acronym, like we always do. Um, research, optimization, analytics, and data services. Uh, 6.5 FTE, primarily our SCALCOM people, our open education folk, um, some data science capabilities, mostly um, through some, some of the work that I do. Um, and then we had data, our data librarians and um, some analysis or analytics folks. And uh, in our slides, a lot of this stuff is linked. Um, the MOU actually isn't linked, but like the Rhodes proposal, if you wanna see that. Um, so this, the slides are richer than they appear. I'll just, I'll just mention that. <clears throat> um, the other component of this, as we did that assessment, we started to realize what the activities could be. Um, and you saw that list of five partners, and this, this ranged from like training, professional development, mentorship, grant proposal development, um, computing, data science, all of that kind of going under that umbrella. And so those early conversations were about how do you fit all of that into a kind of a singular vision and, and parts of these activities. So you can see on here, um, the different generic activities that we place. Um, these, and these have become, uh, they're, they're kind of connected to services that we, that we put forward. Um, 
you probably recognize in those, uh, that third bullet, publication, presentation, preserve, disseminate, measuring impact, those, were, those are the places where our roads group really is integrated. But um, being part and seeing all of this, this sort of suite of services has been really beneficial for us and for others in, outside of the library. Um, <clears throat> so what's happened? What's happened is a number of projects and, and uh, the virtual partnership, again, the idea had been around for a long time. Uh, we went through various forms of not only our own internal leadership, we uh, different people in the provost's office. So there was like, I just want to present to this group that this, there's like a long game with some of these ideas. And we, we just worked through it and just, we had a vision. Um, Dorlin was some continuity, I was some continuity, but we watched and trying to place this, uh, there, were, there were ups and downs. It wasn't like a, a straight through line. Um, so just encouraging you all, if you're thinking about this, that that's something uh, to just be, be patient with. <clears throat> but here we are, uh, we moved in together uh, in, in August. Um, which is an interesting question we should probably get to uh, with the students asking questions. Um, but immediately, uh, these, these projects had kind of been in place, but they, um, they also took off as we started to co-locate. So you can kind of see we doing things with um, research computing around GPUs and access to GPUs so we can build custom models. I'm gonna show a couple of two visualizations just so you can see this. Um, we can now do, we're doing, uh, there was a need for network analysis on generally like the way research outputs happen and the scholars and how those collaboration networks happen. So we were able to do some work to uh, diagnose and forecast where, how research happens, who are likely collaborators, things like that. Um, we've always been part of teaching and instruction. You can kind of see that there. Uh, we've also been interested in visibility of our researchers. We're a, a land grant with an outreach uh, goal um, for citizen to engage in citizen science and that sort of thing. So this was right in our wheelhouse. And then with the undergraduate scholars program, we have student mentors and then we also have uh, students that we hire into these projects um, who are occasionally given course credit or mentoring and or just the, the library is a lab for parts of these activities. Um, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is one of the first, the research analytics, and this is a, a, our ability to sort of look at big, the big data in, I wouldn't call it, small data, in local small data and do um, topic clustering network analysis, understand where people are. Um, and we were able to actually predict or offer recommendations for who they might collaborate with outside of, of the university. Um, and this was connected directly to our Center for Faculty Excellence partners. They are looking frequently for who, who's a good mentor, who would, who would, if I was going to do research outside of our community, where would I go? Um, so these are the kinds of asks, and just by being co-located and being intentional about our services, these are the kind of partnerships you can start to see. Um, we've also been doing uh, visibility in general, just gen uh, how do you, how does research and data and outputs move into the ecosystem, not only locally, but even beyond? So this is a small example of a uh, work with the Office of Research Development. Um, I'm pausing because they also want, they're, they're also looking to do some partners, like they're, they're, we do a lot of service outreach oppor learning opportunities, and there's a data set that we can do an analysis on now that'll do very much, uh, answer some of the same questions. This is actually about our, data sets um, in, in the building uh, or in, that we, we curate. And I really wanna come back around to this and we'll, we'll have a little more time. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna ask you questions. We wanna hear from you too. So um, this is about people for us. Um, this is right outside my office. This is the, where the, the component, where the, our partner, our RCI partner uh, is sitting and this is a, a data science consult and then there's another, the student is sitting with another student and the point I'm gonna make with this is that the virtual partnership was good. Um, we had a lot of momentum, but the, I, I'm able to move, see, 
say hello if I hear something or they might pull me in and say, hey, this student is working in this direction. Do you have projects or do you have a data set that might help us? Um, this is the type of stuff that's happening now with the co-location. Um, it's intentional work to connect. So it's beyond co-location. These are kind of the ideas I was just making. Um, and then if, you, if, you ha if you're not familiar with uh, Rebecca Bryant, she puts, uh, she sort of coined a term around social interoperability, and this is really parts of it in practice, where we're um, thinking along, what are the services, where do we align, how do we align with other partners, how are we stronger, but then also, how do you connect, um, once you're in a space, how do you do this socially and uh, intentionally? So you things like open house, uh, we're part of the Research Development Day, which is a training event in January for, for all of campus. Um, we've done data needs and assessment together. There's monthly meetings with shared governance, um, weekly check-ins, and even the, the, the fun stuff, like tea times and potlucks. Um, I'm gonna put, this is our contact information, so you, can, you can see Lauren and Michael, um, and then Doralyn and myself. Uh, these will be on the slides. But I also wanna just move us to some leading questions and you're free to ask any questions about where we, anything you've heard, but we also wanted to just uh, try to facilitate a bit of a discussion. So if there's something striking you in these questions that I put on, on the screen or if you just wanna kind of talk about some other things, we wanna we want hear from you. So please ask questions as we turn towards this part of the presentation. Thank you. have a question related to the RCD capabilities model. Um, one of the things that we hear consistently that it's complex and there's resources that are needed to um, leverage the tool. And so it would be great to hear from you how you, you know, got the team together to go through the model. I was not a part of um, MSU doing that because, um, okay, do you mean like conducting the assessment itself or like discussing the results? Uh, both the combination, but even <laughs> just, if you just want to focus on conducting the assessment. So I wasn't this, actually a part of conducting the assessment. That was done solely by um, Mike and his team at HPC. And then like after looking at the results, he brought um, the library, several from the library in, then we brought in ITS and we brought in um, OSRC. But as looking through the model and like just assessing it and taking a look, it's very, very long, but it's not overly complicated. You have main bulletin, main bulletin points of like, here's where your strength is, like data facing or data visualization, data analysis. But then you get to write notes that you create saying, okay, why were we not strong on this? Why are we very strong on this? And so there's lots of parts, but they all feed into each other to create a really good picture. So I would say if someone brings you this and you want to take a look at it, please don't be intimidated by it. Yeah, and, and Lauren, if I can yeah. add add to that. So I will say, um, so Lauren, you're right. I, I apologize, you weren't up front. So um, Deborah Lee, the uh, Associate Dean uh, of the Libraries, actually, when we got to the data part, and I'll tell you, so it was a little bit of brute force up front where you're like, hey, we've got this tool, we really need to see where we stand. And um, we started at HPC and just realized that we didn't have the whole skill set or all the capabilities on campus. Um, and then when we did bring it to the library, they provided significant uh, help on assessing the data facing portion as well. The other thing they did do for us is that we, the HPC brought a lot of the software and the system kind of knowledge. Um, we were able to go with that through that with the associate dean uh, and just kind of confirm that maybe there wasn't some existing capability that we had overlooked um, over there. Um, I will tell you that you're right. This is a data science project. And a lot of times, the hardest part of any data science project is finding the data set. Uh, and it, it does require some time, uh, but I can tell you it, it is worth the payoff. And I will agree completely with Lauren is, you know, once you sit down and become familiar with it yourself, as you guide people through it, 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 is, not, um, it is not over daunting, uh, in my opinion. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, a part of it is convincing the internal stakeholders to participate. 
A hundred percent. And, you know, that's that's a bit of an art, if you ask me, in the sense of, you know, trying to figure out what do people want and then trying to figure out how that how to convince them this fits in with what they want. So um, good luck at your institution. I, I know it's that's a hand carved wooden shoe, right? That that doesn't have a, a one size fits all. I would, I would also say our, our experience. Can you hear me? Is this yeah. on? Okay. Um, our experience was a little different. It was grassroots. And so we have an embedded data librarian. Her name is Venice Baird. She was on a particular grant, but she's also very active in the CARC community, which created the tool. Um, so she recognized the opportunity, and we had enough connections, but we kind of brought it grassroots. We knew we had a story to tell to the provost and our current dean, um, but we wanted to gather, uh, gather information and do that assessment so that we could bring the talking points and we could benchmark ourselves and make the case. So you, you can kind of you can stay here and come down or you could kind of follow our, our model. Either, either, either could work potentially depending on your culture. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This was so interesting. Um, so I'm from the University of Kentucky and we are opening um, a service that it's, it's collaborative, but it's not quite as intensely collaborative as, as these two examples. And um, I'm curious, I think this is mostly a question for the Montana people. So when you talk about co-locating, the other folks who are not coming from the libraries, what what is their percentage of time that's dedicated to this? And how did you advocate for that time? <laughs> Um, so they are permanently located in the library, most of them. So the Office of Research and Development, this is their offices, like the, the people, that you, is that what you're asking? Uh, more so like if you think about their distribution of effort. So mm -hmm. are they full time, like this is their job, they are there to be at this center and help whenever? Okay, so they, um, all of these entities were not in very great spaces on campus and so Frankly, at first, I think they were just excited about being in a better space, <laughs> and then they were sort of seeing the benefits of actually co-locating. Yeah. So um, they, we encourage people to come by by appointment, so um, that's our primary encouragement, but people can drop in and sort of, we've got office hours that people can drop in, but there's not an expectation that they're ready at a drop of a hat. So each person in there is trying to hold specific office hours that, that they're sort of in charge of advertising themselves, and we put that on our Research Alliance website as well. We also still have individual web pages for all the entities in there, so we haven't like taken away their identities or just part of a bigger thing. So um, we do have students that um, Jason had mentioned when they, people first walk in. We've got students that we have hired from some of the different partners so that if somebody comes in, at least they've got somebody there who can say, hello, welcome to the center, you know, how can we help you? Um, so I'd say on average, um, you probably have each of the people in there, you know, having five to 10 hours a week of more drop in, but the rest of the time they're just doing the rest of their work. Okay. Um, and did I answer, does that answer all your questions? Yes, no, okay. that's great, thank okay. you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kara Watley from Caltech, and I have a related question. Evidently, we were tracking on the same thing. I was interested in the service models for both of your services and kind of how you developed them. Um, and my experiences on most campuses, the library has a different concept of what service is than many of the other units, even if they are public facing. Um, and one of the challenges of these kinds of collaborations is getting everybody on the same page for what that means. And then I'd love to hear more about your MOU, Montana, because I think that was brilliant. Um, and if you could just share some more details about it, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. I think for the service concept, um, I, we were anticipating that this was going to be a challenge because we are so much more service oriented in the sense of um, <coughs> being used to people coming up to us without necessarily expecting them. So I, th I would say with that's still a little bit of work in progress, but one of the things we had to do is try to create what Jason helped do was create a cheat sheet for the people at the library entry service desk so they could sort of tell people this is what you've got up in the Research Alliance, and then a cheat sheet for the Research <coughs> Alliance people to understand when somebody came in looking for a library service, how they could refer back out. So that's been a real learning opportunity about the work that each other has done. Um, and we do also try to do things like share 
calendar so that if there's a workshop going on that people understand that that's a research alliance workshop. Um, and a lot of that we did put in the memorandum of understanding and we tried to guess on a lot of those things ahead of time. Invariably things come up that you hadn't come up with but in the memorandum, but the memorandum says we will revisit it once a year and so it's not like it's set in stone permanently. So I think part of what's helped with the, the memorandum <laughs> is that it's really made it as a shared um, effort. So we don't say this is your job, it's not gonna fall on the nicest person to go take care of this thing while all the other people are doing the more important work. It's, you know, we all own it. And I think that set that tone up front that this is a jointly um, shared um, effort. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got anything you wanna add. I, I just wanna, I wanna make sure Lauren has, because the, the question was also about services and so, what you were seeing, like how did you set up that model? So we're still in the beginning stages, the very planning stages, so we haven't, we don't have the concrete set up like Montana does, but one of the shared things that Montana and I do, uh, Montana and M MS, Mississippi State does have, they're all the <laughs> MSUs, is we're both land-grant institutions. Then that kind of harkens back to the core mission of every one of us, because we have extension offices throughout the state, so we have around 80 of them, I think that's how many, 80, how, how many counties we have. And so being able to tie that back into, even if you are a behind the scenes, if you're not public facing, you are still working at a land grant institution. The purpose of a land grant is to educate the public, is to be a resource for the public. And so that, getting everyone on the idea of that, at least that's an approach that we can handle and we can take. Going back to the MOU, I will make sure to go back to the slides and add a link to that so that you can find the MOU. It's not meant to be private, it just didn't <laughs> make it into the slides for some reason. And, and there are, there are, I think there are revisions we've made. There are things like we, we uh, suggested analytics, like what would a, we need metrics for what does success look like? Now that's not, that's not formalized in the MOU, but it is, it is a goal, right? It's part mm -hmm. of like, yeah, we need to be thinking of this so we can continue, continue the partnership and see, and kind of define, define success. So this is a question for the folks at Montana. And I'm curious about what the collaborations look like with the Office of Research Development, what sorts of, in, in, you know, cross-pollination happens there. Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I think so. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm kind of bu buzzing because uh, <laughs> just last week there's, there's a new, I kind of mentioned it in the presentation, but so typically the, the, there, there, uh, there's an outreach branch and then there's a generative how do you build a collaborative team? How do you think about a grant proposal? Mm -hmm. um, and both of those, those are two of their primary surface, services. So the, the sort of matchmaking or the recommendation of what, you know, what, is, what is our research community? How does it work? Mm -hmm. those, those kind of, our, our, our entrance into that question or that service is usually around analysis of local research. Okay. Um, they're really interested in that. Uh, that's the, the, uh, the sort of generative side of, sure. of research development. And then you've got the outreach component, which are look they're looking for how do, we, how do we talk about impact? How do we bring the message about this research to the extension agents so that mm -hmm. they could, could potentially use it? Um, and then most recently, just how do we catalog the, the outreach of... Mm. So one of the things we can do with our local local data is understand how what kinds of service partnerships are out there. So in the same way that we were doing analysis with something like an output like a data set, we can mine that data for the partner and say, oh, well, th this is the type of service partnership that exists. Here's another one. These two are related in this way. This is the faculty member that worked in that direction. So that that component of Outreach is, is the other piece that we really see from them. And it's early. It's sure. early. Um, I think there'll be others that I don't even know about yet. Cool. I think, Thank you. I think the other thing just to add to that is I think we just talk more as just in general how we kind of <laughs> conversation. And so we realize that they are helping people with pre-grant awards. And I don't know how many times I've experienced on campus where people say, oh, if I just put that in my grant, right? If I just mm -hmm. put in my grant that this is where I'm going to store this data and maybe I need some funding to help store the, the data. And right. so they, we are sort of more on their minds at 
saying, hey, we can help with data management plans. Please pull us in when you're at that stage and not have it as an afterthought. So, right. and a lot of that is just a sort of brainstorming of how we can coordinate that work. So I, I think if nothing else, the library is actively on the minds of the other people in the room, and that's partly because we have a physical presence in the space. They're not just in the building with us, we're in the space with them. Right. So I think that makes a huge difference in just thinking about that whole cycle that I put on, not just your piece of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to be mindful that we We've got, actually have Yeah, a, we have four minutes before the next session starts. Mm -hmm. So I just have one more yeah. question. If you uh, to as a land grant institution, um, are you working with the other libraries in sharing, you know, best practices and the processes that you've put in place? Uh, in this, our, in our state, you mean? Yeah. Um, Montana is a really small state, relative, not physically, but. Land, uh, institution wise, the University of Montana is really the only other school that's anywhere close to the size of us, and we're, we're double the size of them. So, um, so we are willing to do that, but I think what we're taking on here, there's just not scaled to the other institutions in Montana. I don't know about Mississippi. Mike and I, um, during some of our meetings, we've talked about potentially scaling upwards, but for right now, we're trying to focus on just getting the framework around. Would you agree with that, Mike? A hundred percent. I definitely like to get something more established at Mississippi State University, but I, I will say Mississippi as a state has two other R1 institutes and one R2 uh, research level institute. So there are aspirations, and I, I don't want to get too deep into that now, but there are aspirations of creating this as a broader statewide uh, capability. Yeah, and I think there's, I guess there's potential there for us, but... We've been kind of inwardly focused up to this point, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for staying, for your great questions, and for the collaborations of the MSUs. Mm -hmm. So, um, and go enjoy some lightning talks. Mm -hmm.